The Lumix J6. I've been using it for over a year now in all sorts of situations and got to know it really well. I've been using it for travel, wildlife, corporate and weddings. And in this video, I will share with you my experiences with it from a video perspective and how it held up over time. This video is, however, not a deep dive into all the G86's features. Instead, I'll be going over the things that I think make this a great camera, the features that I use the most, what I found works really well, but also the things that I don't like so much and could be improved. And I'll also be comparing it a bit to the G9, uh, which I'm shooting on right now. A camera that I've been using much longer and that I use now alongside my G86. Let's talk about it. If you're new here, my name is Sebastian and welcome to the channel. When I started writing this review, I didn't think it would be this long, but I have a lot to say about the G86. I'm breaking this review up in a few chapters, for which, as usual, I've put chapter markers in. Let's talk about the design and the handling of the G86 first. And I'll take it off. It's chunky for a Micro Four Thirds camera, but it's really rugged. It's weather resistant, of course, and I've used it in salty and wet conditions. No problem so far. It feels solid and relatively heavy. Uh, and I like that because it feels stable and solid. I like the fact that the doors for the ports are properly hinged, unlike the ones on the G9 that just sort of bend. These are properly hinged. On the flip side, what I don't really like so much is the battery door. It's not textured and the mechanism to open it, first pushing down before you can slide it back, it's not my favorite, but it works fine. But I much prefer the one on the G9, which is properly textured and you only have to slide it back to open it. Arguably the G86's card slot door is more secure, but I never had the problem of accidentally opening the, the card slot door on the G9. When it comes to the fan in the G86 and overheating, well, I haven't had an overheating problem once with this camera, as expected from a Lumix GH series camera. And I haven't heard the built-in fan once during recording. And I have the, the fan mode set to mode two. My G86 lives in the small rig Black Mamba cage permanently, but because this cage has such a a slim fit, the grip is very much usable. I will say that the grip is on the large side, especially with the, with the cage on, but it's close to perfect for me because I have relatively big hands. Comparing it to the grip of the G9, I'd say that reaching the, the front FN buttons uh, is a bit easier on the G9 and you have to, with the G86, you have to reach around a bit with your fingers. I find that difference most noticeable when I'm shooting wildlife where I have the front FN button set to near and far focus and I look through the viewfinder. For other types of shooting I don't really mind reaching around a bit more for the FN buttons as the camera will be rigged up anyway and I don't use near and far focus uh, in those types of shoots. The LCD screen design of the G86 I find absolutely amazing. I love that you can tilt it up uh, in two stages and you can flip it out. I use it tilted up most of the time because it's less vulnerable, uh, it doesn't stick out, and, but more importantly, the screen is on the same axis as the lens and the sensor. But when I do use it flipped out, the tilting mechanism is still very useful because the screen can now rotate freely even when there are cables plugged into the side like the HDMI or USB-C cable. Speaking of cables and ports, I think the benefit of a full-size HDMI port goes without saying and I think the location of all the ports uh, is great. The EVF on the G86 is comparable to the one on the G9. Both have the same resolution. However, the punch-in on the G86 is quite soft, softer than on the G9. But unlike the G9, 
with the G86 you can punch in during recording. Not that that really makes up for the softness, but it is a very useful feature. Also, the G86 has a dedicated timecode port. More about that later. The button layout I found is great and very useful and utilitarian. Utilitarian. I particularly like the dedicated AF on uh, button. I use that a lot uh, when in manual focus and I want to quickly focus on something and then go with manual focus from there. And the dedicated audio button that brings up uh, the screen with all the audio information you need to know. You can reassign this button to something else because um, it's a custom button, but I left it at default for the audio screen. I find it very convenient. The recording button on the front is so nice. I use it all the time when the camera is rigged up. I can keep my right hand on the top handle and my left hand at the, like the follow focus and I can hit record with my left hand, so I can keep holding the camera on the top handle. I, I think this is, um, this is one of the most useful things about the button layout on the G86. And when I'm filming myself for, for YouTube, uh, it's also very useful because I can uh, just have the camera facing me and hit record there. I, um, yeah, I use that a lot. And that's also where the, the tally lights come in. Uh, the G86 has tally lights on the front and on the back. And when I'm recording myself for YouTube, it's very handy to have a tally light on the front that tells me whether I'm actually recording or not. Both tally lights are also customizable in intensity, which is great. The lock lever on the side of the body is, I found very useful, especially because it's so customizable. You can set what it locks and what it doesn't lock. I have it set up so it locks all the dials on the body so that I don't accidentally change uh, ISO or aperture or shutter speed, which when I first got it, um, that happened a lot actually, because I, be, I would be holding it like this uh, with the Ninja 5 on top. And then with my wrist, I would um, accidentally turn the dial and close the aperture down to uh, f16 or something. So I learned my lesson and flicked the lever so that this doesn't do anything. I also have a few things to say about the menus in this camera. But in general, I quite like the menus and I find them to be quite intuitive. I really like the My Menu, much like on the G9, but with a lot more options and pages. I've put a lot of things in there, in the My Menu, so that I don't have to dive into the camera's menus to, to find it. It's, uh, it's super convenient. I also have it set up so that when I press Menu, that it goes to the My Menu immediately. And I'm also very happy with the Quick Menu. You can quickly change lots of settings and it's also customizable. Which, uh, which is great. And I, I use that actually a lot. I hardly ever go into the actual menus. Also because uh, it shows you the rec quality my list. That's the list you can set up with your favorite or most used uh, codecs, frame rates and resolutions. Uh, because the G86 has such a long list of codecs and resolutions and frame rates that it's a bit of a pain to have to scroll through all of them to find the one that you actually want to use. So I have a relatively short list set up in the Red Quality My List, and that's in the Quick Menu. One thing I will say though, is that the, this camera has so many features that going through the menus can be a bit overwhelming, and it takes a good bit of time to get used to. It's a, the menus are a learning curve. The G86 has a ton of custom modes. It's on the dial you have C1 to C4, and once you are in C4, you have 10 more uh, custom modes. But to be completely honest, I hardly use them actually, because uh, there's so many you can already quickly access in the quick menu, for example. I do have some custom modes set up, uh, for example, for when I want to shoot in 5.7K or in 5.8K open gate. And I have one custom mode set up for live streaming. 
But the camera has shutter angle and a quickly accessible quick menu where you can quickly. But the camera has shutter angle and a quick menu that where you can quickly access different frame rates. So I don't usually need to switch to a custom mode because if I change the frame rate and have the camera set up uh, in shutter angle, I can just as easily switch from 25p uh, to 50 or 100p just from the quick menu. The G86 is rated as having seven and a half stops of image stabilization when paired with lenses that are compatible with dual IS. In my experience, comparing it with the G9, which also has excellent stabilization, I can only see a difference when I use lenses that are compatible with dual IS. However, it seems like when I'm using very long focal lengths, uh, like 300 or 400 millimeters, the G9 seems to handle that a bit better in terms of stabilization. Something I use on both cameras a lot is the IS boost function. That works absolutely great for handheld, stable, mostly static shots. Overall, I'd say the G86 performs slightly better than the G9 in terms of stabilization, but it isn't night and day. Um, and it's only when used with dual IS compatible lenses. If I use non-stabilized lenses or lenses that aren't compatible with dual IS, then they're about the same, both very good. However, when I use manual lenses um, that have no stabilization, I do prefer using the G86, because on the G86 you can set a list of focal lengths quickly accessible with a custom button which makes it really easy to, when you swap lenses, uh, set the right focal length in order to get good stabilization. And especially when using manual zoom lenses like the DZO lenses that I have. And there's also stabilization settings for anamorphic lenses. Unfortunately, I haven't ever used anamorphic lenses. I would really like to get my hands on, on one or more. So Siri or Vazen, if you're watching this, get in touch. It's quite a power hungry camera, which given all the features, frame rates and bit rates it offers is understandable. So unlike the G9 that seems to run forever on a single battery, battery life on the G86 is not particularly good and definitely needs an external power source or more batteries for longer shoots. The higher the frame rate and resolution you record in, the sooner it runs out of power which makes sense. I have four BLK22 batteries, the ones that the G86 takes uh, for mine. But most of the time I'll use a V-mount battery like this FX Lion Nano 1 or this Vemico one and power it through USB-C. Um, by the way, this Vemico one is a very good deal. It offers all the same features as the FX Lion um, but it's a bit bigger, more co higher capacity, and it's a lot cheaper. The obvious downside to using the USB-C port for power is, of course, that you lose the ability to record to an SSD. And there's no solution or workaround for that. I have tested and tried different things, but you just can't power the camera and record to SSD at the same time. In the studio setup, I'll use a dummy battery to USB-C plugged into the wall or a suitable power bank or V-mount battery. I have a whole video about different power solutions and how power works for various cameras and for the G86 and the G9 in particular, if you're interested. There's a link in the description. I've switched to the G86 now uh, to talk about uh, autofocus and manual focus. It is now in autofocus. Uh, full area mode with human detection and it's the Panasonic Leica 12 to 60 at f3.1 and I have a video in the works where I go in depth on autofocus and manual focus if that video is already out I'll link it up here in this video I'll stick to my experiences using the G86 with both manual and autofocus Let's start with the continuous autofocus. First, I want to say I'm not going to compare its DFD contrast detection system to a face detect autofocus system 
or talk about which one is better. I'm just going to talk about my experience using the GH6's autofocus. Overall, I think the autofocus is very good and is a big improvement over the G9, for example, in terms of reliability and pulsing. But it has its limitations. Let's start with the reliability. In my experience, when using con continuous autofocus for shots where there's a person in frame moving around, the G86 does really well. In these situations, I use the full area mode with human detection and all speed and sensitivity settings at default, like it is now. Something sticking in my leg. It stays locked on to the person and it's also very smooth most of the time when a person walks towards, walks towards or away from the camera. If the subject has a more predictable position in the frame, in a talking head studio situation, for example, I use the one area plus mode with human detection and set the AF speed to minus one and sensitivity to minus three. This has been working really well for me. The autofocus does become very limited for fast moving subjects on longer focal lengths in particular, like birds in flight, for example. It loses the subject or it doesn't keep it in focus even when the animal detection yellow box is still on it. It seems to hunt a bit in those uh, scenarios. I actually stopped using autofocus for that because it's too unreliable and use manual focus instead. Which, by the way, is not an easy job with a long lens and birds in flight. But to be honest, maybe I've given up too soon and I should do some more testing. The other modes like the zone or tracking mode, I haven't really used much and therefore I can't really say anything about. The G86 also has two features called focus transition and focus limiter. The focus transition feature lets you set three points between which the camera will focus rack and you can set the speed at which it does that. I found it useful for product shots and I can imagine it could be useful for narrative filmmaking where you can plan out your shots. The only thing I think could improve it would be the ability to set the transition speed in seconds instead of SL, L, M, H and SH. I mean, I get that it's from very slow to very fast, but I mean, how slow is it and how fast is it? So seconds would be great. The focus limiter lets you set two points between which it's allowed to focus. It helps with the occasional under or overshooting of the, of the autofocus and it reduces pulsing as well. Pulsing then. As we all know, pulsing is a major drawback of the contrast detection DFD autofocus system. But it's not always a problem and the GH6 definitely shows less pulsing than the G9 or the GH5. In most situations, I don't have a problem with a little bit of pulsing because it's usually hardly noticeable when using wider focal lengths and in outdoor daylight situations. It becomes more apparent when using longer focal lengths, shallower depth of field and blurry lights in the background. So that's a situation where I won't use autofocus. But with all the improvements to the autofocus and the introduction of face detect autofocus in the S5 Mark II, I will keep using manual focus most of the time as it is obviously the most reliable and the only one to blame if something's out of focus is me. Besides, there are certain things that autofocus can't do that I will talk about in my AF versus MF video. I also have a fair amount of manual lenses anyway. Which leads me into the manual focus experience with this camera. It's the first Lumix camera to have the punch-in ability available during recording which is great but as i said it's a bit soft so it's helpful but not as helpful as it could be if it was a bit sharper and then there's the focus peaking it works you can set the sensitivity and the color and i find it to be okay but it could be a bit yeah how do you call it a bit sharper or a bit clearer in my opinion but when it comes to using the focus peaking over HDMI to an external monitor, I think it's basically unusable. It looks like the intensity of the focus peaking is being halved on the external monitor. In terms of lenses, 
it is great to have the ability to use the focus ring on compatible fly-by-wire lenses in a linear way. This came in an update to the G9 as well and was a massive usability improvement for manual focus. And the G86 has it out of the box. But when using manual lenses, the G86 has a feature that makes life a little bit easier. Like I said before, you can set a list of focal lengths and access it with a custom button. It makes it so easy to change the focal length when you swap lenses. And you do need to set the focal length in order for the IBIS to work properly with manual lenses. The image quality from the G86 is stunning, in my opinion, and a big step up from the G9. I shoot vlog most of the time, and I think the colors are absolutely beautiful. There's a certain richness to the colors and the skin tones look natural. It has the full vlog version, and to my eyes, that makes a difference compared to Vlog L from the GH5 or G9. Highlight roll-off looks very smooth, for example. Vlog L from the G9 looks a lot harsher, and there's definitely more room to play with in post with the full version of Vlog. But it's not just the fact that it has the full Vlog version that makes the difference. It's also due to the increased dynamic range of the G86. It offers over 12 stops of dynamic range without DR Boost on and over 13 stops of dynamic range with DR Boost on, where the G9 caps out at a bit over 10 stops. I made a whole video about DR Boost, by the way. Um, if you want to know more about it, there's a link in the description. But in short, in my experience with DR Boost, I found it's best to have DR Boost on as much as possible because it does increase dynamic range and on average better noise performance at higher ISOs. But due to the fact that the base ISO goes to 2000 in Vlog with DR Boost on, it's tricky in bright situations. You need a really strong ND filter to bring the exposure down. So usually in those situations, I'll shoot with DR Boost off. DR Boost doesn't seem to do much for the dynamic range in Rec. 709 profiles. Other profiles I use on the GH6 are the Natural Profile and Like 709. The Natural Profile looks very good in my opinion, and it's the easiest to work with when you want to shoot in a Rec. 709 profile that looks good straight out of camera. Colors look amazing, and again, Highlight Roll-Off looks very smooth. It's been my favorite Rec. 709 profile on the G9 as well. But the implementation on the G86 looks even better. The Like 709 profile, I think, is not the nicest looking profile. It handles highlights very differently from the natural profile. These two shots are exposed exactly the same. But look at the white wall in both shots. In Like 709, it's completely blown out. It also somehow looks a bit harsher to my eyes than the natural profile. But it's a useful profile for indoor live streaming purposes. The natural profile is more suitable for outdoor scenarios in my experience. But with that said, I much prefer shooting in Vlog. It's super easy to work with in post, at least in DaVinci Resolve. If you use Resolve's Color Managed Workflow or Color Space Transform, you don't even need to use LUTs to get it to look good. I did, however, do my best to create a conversion LUT that converts the colors from the G9 in Vlog L to the colors of the G86. You can download it for free. There's a link to the video I made about it and my Kofi page in the description. I know some of you shoot in HLG, but I actually never use it and haven't really tested it either. I shot some things in HLG with the G9 a long time ago and didn't really like it back then. And I haven't had a reason to test it with the G86 because Vlog looks so good and is so easy to work with. When it comes to low light, the G86 is definitely a step up from previous models like the G9. I'll shoot up to ISO 6400 and get good results. Whereas with the G9, I usually don't go over ISO 1600, maybe 3200 max. A bit of noise reduction in post make the results even better. The key though to good footage with the G86 in low light is to expose properly. If you raise the ISO and the image or subject is still underexposed, it is going to be noisy. But this is true for any camera, micro, four thirds or full frame. 
underexposed footage is going to be noisy. I also want to briefly touch on the streaking issue. I have had a few instances where streaking appeared. It wasn't very obvious, but it was there. In my experience, the key to avoid streaking is to properly expose your shot. Underexposed shots are definitely more prone to show streaking. Also, shooting with DR Boost on seems to give better results. But overall, it's not been much of an issue for me. My fellow YouTuber, Red Thompson, talked about this issue and how to avoid it. So check out his channel if you want to know more. I'll link his channel in the description. So the G86 is a fully 10-bit camera, which is great. It makes a huge difference compared to 8-bit in terms of color detail and the ability to adjust colors in post. I was already shooting 10-bit with my G9 in 25p internally and higher frame rates to Anatomous Ninja 5. So the fact that the G86 does all frame rates and codecs in 10-bit is awesome. The ones I use most are the 4K long op codecs in 25 and 50p in 10-bit 42 and 4K 100p in 10-bit 420. And it all looks equally good. I use the 5.7K option mostly for wildlife. It allows me to crop into the image on the 4K timeline and still retain 4K resolution. I sometimes shoot in an all-eye codec when there's lots of movement in the frame or when I shoot in ProRes, which is all-eye anyway. More about ProRes in a second. The 5.8K open gate mode, I don't use a whole lot. I personally haven't had much demand for delivery in multiple aspect ratios, so there's really no need for me to use it yet. But as I said earlier, I would very much like to shoot an anamorphic someday and use the open gate mode for that. I also don't use the Cinema 4K options and don't have them in my rare quality list in the quick menu. In my opinion, and for my use cases, it's basically useless. If I want to have black bars at the top and bottom, I'll do that in post with my regular 4K UHD footage. And I also don't need the extra resolution in width that C4K has. None of what I shoot is going to be shown on a big cinema screen, at least not in the foreseeable future. That also brings me to ProRes, ProRes RAW and external recording to SSD. So I find myself not shooting in ProRes internally or to an SSD for a few reasons. The most important one is that 4K, oh, all the mosquitoes. The most important one is that 4K UHD is not available in ProRes. So I'm forced to shoot C4K or 5.7K in ProRes that both have the 17 by 9 aspect ratio, as opposed to 4K UHD with the regular 16 by 9 ratio. The only ProRes option in 16 by 9 is Full HD, which I don't normally shoot in. So for me, there's no benefit for me to shooting in ProRes internally or to an SSD, apart from the fact that it does make a difference in editing. ProRes is just easier on my system in terms of playback. I edit on an M1 Mac Mini with 16 gigs of RAM and on my M1 12.9 inch iPad Pro, if you're interested. When I'm using my Atomus Ninja 5 to record to, I do use ProRes. Mostly ProRes LT in that case. That way I do get ProRes in 4K UHD. The higher quality ProRes options like 422 and 422 HQ do step up the quality a bit, but I think using those is only useful if you're going to do heavy color grading, special effects or green screen work. Recording to an SSD in MOV, however, has clear benefits. For longer shoots, it is perfect. I can connect a two terabyte drive and just leave it rolling for hours if needs be. SSD are also significantly cheaper per gigabyte than CF Express cards or SD cards for that matter. But like I said earlier, you lose the ability to power the camera via USB-C, which for me is a big downside. I wish they would have designed it like the recently announced Nikon Z8. That camera has two USB-C ports, one for power, and one for data. That would have been perfect. And then there's ProRes RAW recording over HDMI to an Atomus Ninja 5 or 5 Plus. To be honest, I've only tried it once, 
the reason for that is mainly the limitation of my editing software, DaVinci Resolve. There's no support for ProRes RAW in Resolve. I did try a converter that converts ProRes RAW into Cinema DNG, but the free version only converts a few seconds. And because I have no real need to shoot RAW, I can't justify paying for the converter. The few seconds that I did convert looked stunning though, and very different from the non-RAW Pro, uh, ProRes. There was so much more room to push the image around in terms of colors, but the file sizes are absolutely massive. And unless I have a specific situations, uh, situation or need for shooting RAW, I probably won't use it much. Even if DaVinci Resolve adds support, for ProRes RAW, although I might use a bit more then. Another option would be the addition of B-RAW to the G86, which is not completely unlikely. This is not what I normally do. I'm now shooting myself in 5.7K B-RAW. <laughs> but B-RAW is less raw than ProRes RAW, and I would need to get a Blackmagic Video Assist 12G to be able to record in B-RAW. One thing to note in relation to HDMI, uh, is about the complaints I've heard about lag that appears when using an external monitor. And yes, there is signif significant lag with the G86 when you're using an external monitor. I'm not really all that bothered by it, but there is a workaround. If you turn off audio over HDMI, it reduces the lag significantly. So if you don't mind not having audio going to your external monitor, it's a good way to reduce the lag. The G86 is very capable when it comes to high quality audio. Although I will say that the preamps seem a bit more hissy than the G9s, but it can record up to 96 Hz, 24 bit audio. And in terms of audio monitoring and managing, the G86 stands out and is a joy to use. First of all, there's the dedicated audio button that brings up the screen that shows all the information you need to know and you can also bring the gain down to minus 18 dB and it even have a, has a low gain setting. You can also set the 3.5 mm jack input to line level, which I often use to plug the line out of my Zoom H5 uh, recorder into. It can also record up to four channels of audio if you use the XLR1 adapter. Now I don't have the XLR1, so I'm only able to record two channels. I've thought about getting the XLR one, but still haven't decided because one, it's quite expensive. And two, I won't be able to use my top handle because of the height of the XLR one adapter. Also, two channels of audio is usually enough for what I do. Channels three and four are still embedded in the video file, regardless of using the XLR one or not. This is somewhat annoying and takes an extra step in post. But that's easy enough by selecting all the clips, going to clip attributes and deleting channels three and four. That way they're gone before you put any of the clips on the timeline. The G86 also has a dedicated timecode port and internal timecode clock. I have been wanting to start using timecode for a long time now. And earlier this year, I got myself some Tentacle Sync Mark IIs and the Tentacle Sync Track E. Using timecode is such a time saver not just for syncing up a separate audio track with the video, but more so for a multicam setup. And if you have it set to free run, you can start and stop recording on any camera or audio recorder at any time, and it'll all sync up perfectly in post. The fact that it has a dedicated timecode port means two things. One, the timecode will be embedded in the file as metadata timecode, as opposed to uh, a timecode audio signal that has to be converted in post. And two, with my G9, I have to connect the tentacle sync to a mic input, and I therefore lose audio. There are some workarounds for that, but with the G86, I still get to record two channels of audio because I don't have to use the mic input as a timecode input. As I mentioned, it has its own timecode clock so initially I thought, that's great. I can just use the tentacle sync to jam timecode to the J6, let it run on its own and put the tentacle back on my G9 
Well, no. The GH6's internal clock is not very accurate, which is an understatement. The timecodes start drifting almost immediately, making it basically useless. So I have to have a tentacle sync connected that's putting out timecode at all times, which is fine, but let's give him a moment. All right, which is fine, but meant getting an extra tentacle sync. By the way, let me know if you'd like to make me a dedicated video on timecode. The other audio features it offers, like the limiter and wind noise reduction, I don't really use. I'd rather set my levels properly and apply noise reduction in post. But if you don't want to bother with audio or for quick turnaround, those features can be useful. So what about improvements? I would like to see some improvement through firmware for this camera and maybe some things that could be improved in a future successor to the GH6. First off, I would like to see the focus peaking and the punching improved. In particular, focus peaking over HDMI. It's okay, as I mentioned earlier, but it's just not visible enough and the punching is too soft. Speaking of HDMI, when info display over HDMI is turned on, that info display disappears from the camera LCD. I hope they can fix that in a firmware update too, because it's quite annoying. Another firmware update I would like to see is the addition of ProRes 4K UHD to SSD. As I mentioned right now, this is only available in Cinema 4K or 5.7K. I don't really understand why they left out 4K UHD. DR Boost could also be improved in terms of usability. Right now, there's no automatic setting of some sort and some frame rates are grayed out when DR Boost is on. I find it a bit cumbersome to use. I'd like to see an auto setting where it switches DR Boost on when you go over ISO 2000 in Vlog and turns it off when going below that. If DR Boost is not available, like in 4K 100 frames a second or 120, the camera should just turn it off when you select that frame rate. At the moment, you have to manually turn off DR Boost first and then go back to select 4K 100p. It would be a massive usability upgrade. Another thing that I'd like to see, but is not specific to the GA6, is the ability to quickly switch to auto ISO. Right now, if you're at, say, ISO 3200, you have to scroll all the way back to select Auto ISO. What I think would be much easier is if at any ISO value, you could press up on the control dial to switch to Auto. In a future camera, I'd like to see two card slots of the same type. Dual CF Express would be great. I also really hope that a successor will have two USB-C ports, one for power and one for data, so that powering over USB-C and recording to an SSD at the same time is possible. In conclusion, my experience with the G86 has been highly positive. It's an impressive camera. The build and handling are excellent with its rugged design and weather resistance. While there are some minor drawbacks like the card slot door, Overall, the design and handling are excellent. The GH6's image stabilization performs exceptionally well, particularly with dual IS lenses. The image quality is stunning in basically any frame rate. And with the full VLOG version, or in some of the Rec. 709 profiles, it produces rich colors, natural looking skin tones, and very pleasing highlight roll off. I can get footage from the G9 to look pretty close, but it requires some work and I will never get it to look exactly the same. So the G86 is definitely a step up from the G9 in terms of image quality and dynamic range as well. For me, being able to shoot in any frame rate in 10 bit internally is great. No need for an external recorder unless you want to shoot raw. It just makes the workflow a lot smoother and easier. 
Autofocus is definitely usable if you work within the limitations of the system and get to know the limitations. But it's obviously not the camera to get if you heavily depend on autofocus. The focus transition and the limiter features are nice to have and can be useful in some situations. In terms of audio, the G86 is a very capable camera and I've had no problems uh, capturing high quality audio. And with the dedicated time code port, it makes the shooting and editing experience so much easier. Overall, in my opinion, the Lumix G86 is a fantastic camera for videographers. Impressive performance, excellent image quality, and a range of useful features. While it may have some minor drawbacks and a possibly slightly steep learning curve due to its extensive menu options, its strengths far outweigh any limitations, in my opinion. Whether used for travel, wildlife, corporate events or weddings, the G86 has proven to be a reliable and capable camera and I will keep using it for years to come. Wow, that was a lot. Let me know what you think about the G86. I'm curious to know what your experiences are or if you're thinking about picking one up because prices are really attractive at the moment. If you're interested in picking a used one up, you could check out MPB. There's a link in the description if you're interested. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments. And if there are many questions or things that I've left out that you would like to have seen, I'll consider doing a follow-up live stream where you can ask me anything about the G86, from a video perspective, of course. I mean, you could try asking me things about the photography side, but I probably won't have an answer for you. Let me know if you would like me to do a, a live stream like that. Other than that, I hope this video was useful and enjoyable. If so, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel and maybe hit that notification bell. And I hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching.